Who's someone you look up to? Imagine you've got somebody in your mind that, that you admire or are in awe if, or some, somebody that you want to be like or perhaps you wanted to be like. Maybe growing up it was a, a parent or a teacher or, or a coach. But maybe it was, it was somebody else who spoke into your life, who, who influenced you, who helped you out, who mentored you. Or maybe it was somebody that you saw a couple weeks ago on the Olympics and you thought, wow, I wish I could have done that. Or maybe if I asked each and every one of you individually, you'd say, Jesus. How many of us would say Jesus? Yeah, most of us. All right. I mean, we're followers of Jesus, right? If we're Christians, we're supposed to want to be like Jesus? I mean, that's kind of the gimme answer, right? But besides Jesus, who is someone that you've, you've looked up to? And maybe you looked up to them or because not because they were perfect like Jesus, but maybe because you related to them. You saw them go through something that you once went through, and now you felt you had a connection. Or, or maybe when the, the way they handled a situation, you thought, man, I hope if I'm ever in a situation like that, I can handle it like them. Or I'm going through something like that, and I want to follow their example and make sure I handle it as well as they did. You know, there's a lot of people that I've looked up to, people that have helped me, mentored me, loved on me, people that I've, I've admired or, or learned from. But, but when, I, when I think of all the people, there's a particular biblical character that really stands out to me. And that's, that's the Apostle Peter. And, and it's not because he was second in command of Jesus or because people consider him the second best apostle. In fact... Peter was far from perfect. While he was a man of faith, he also had his faults. And perhaps that's one of the reasons I feel like I identify with him. Because in the midst of his faults and his foibles and his failures, he gives us a beautiful example of faith. That even when we fail, he shows us a path back to faithfulness. When Jesus said to follow, Peter followed. When Jesus said to go, Peter went. And when Jesus asked questions, Peter was often quick to answer, sometimes sticking his own foot in his mouth. I can really identify with that. But sometimes Peter had insights that only came from God. In fact, it was Peter who was the one that professed that Jesus was the Christ, the Son of the living God. Peter was bold and courageous. He was competitive. And sometimes he did and said dumb things. But there was no doubting his faith. He was all in for Jesus. Well, except for that one time. And you may know the story, but, but if you don't know that story, if you're not familiar with it, it, it goes something like G this, that Jesus was gathered with his disciples and he was telling them about things that were about to happen, his impending betrayal, his soon-to-come arrest, his abandonment by everyone, and then his death on the cross. And it was Peter that said, no way, not, not on my watch, Jesus, that will never happen. I will never abandon you. I will never let anything happen to you. In fact, I will go to jail for you. And if I have to, I would even die for you. And Jesus responded with, oh, Peter, someday you will surely give your life for me. However, before that happens, in fact, before the rooster crows, you will have denied having ever known me three times. Essentially, Jesus was telling Peter, hey, I know you want to be faithful. I know that you're making this promise to always be there and follow me, but I also know that you're going to break that promise. And as much as you don't want to, I know you will. I know that your faith is going to fail you. Yet when it does, I will still love you. 
and my grace will cover you. And my love and my grace will restore you. And the story played out just as Jesus had promised that Jesus is betrayed and he's arrested. And at first, Peter was true to his word. He stood up, he drew a sword, he drew a sword and he was fighting back. Yet Jesus tells him to stop. No, that is not the way. Do not fight. And when he stopped fighting, all the disciples ran away. And all of them abandoned Jesus, including Peter. Now, Peter wanted to remain faithful, so he watches what's happening from a distance. And he's terribly torn because he, he's longing to be with Jesus, yet he's too terrified to do anything real about it. And then he's recognized. Somebody notices that he had been one of the followers of Jesus, and when they call him out on it, Peter says, no, uh not me. And then he denies ever having known Jesus, not once, but three times. And then the rooster crows, and suddenly Peter becomes painfully aware of what he's done. Shame wells up inside of him. He tries he might to do everything right. He has failed his beloved Jesus. But then he hears the good news that, that Jesus has been resurrected and then the snooze comes from Mary and some of the other women and, and Peter is excited he, and he races to the tomb. And, and while he's not the first one there, he's the first one inside. And sure enough, Jesus isn't there. And then... When he meets the resurrected Jesus, he's full of joy. He's so excited, as were all the other disciples. Yet he is waiting and he's looking for that moment, that one special moment where the two of them, where Peter can have Jesus all to himself and he can pour his heart out to Jesus and make everything right. And he finally gets this moment one morning when Jesus has found that the men have gone back to fishing and Jesus is waiting for them on the shore and he calls out to them and when they recognize and realize it's Jesus, Peter is so excited that he jumps out of the boat and he swims ahead of him, leaving his friends behind so he can be the first one there to Jesus. And he gets to the shore and he, he greets Jesus and Jesus greets him. But instead of pounding Peter with an I told you so, he greets Peter with grace. And he makes a meal for Peter and the other disciples, and he sits down and breakfasts with them. And as the meal was coming to a close, Jesus turns to Peter and says, Peter, do you love me? Have you ever felt like Peter? I know I have. See, I, I grew up in the faith. For me, I, I'm just like most of you. That I, I grew up in the church, and I've never had this radical conversion experience. It, it seems like, uh, you know, I've always been aware of God in my life. Or for, in fact, as far and as long as I can remember, I've, I've had this relationship with God. I've always felt like I've known about Jesus and his love for me. And I can't think of a time in my life when I, I didn't know God or wasn't aware of God's presence. I, I grew up calling myself a Christian. And I've always felt like I could, I could talk or pray or, or sing to God. And some of my youngest memories include going to church and attending Sunday school and sitting in worship with my parents. And then one day, my dad said we're taking a man's vacation. Just the two of us. It was a man's trip. We got on a bus and we rode out to Crested Butte, Colorado, and we went skiing for a week. It was fantastic. I still have vivid memories of it. And one of the things about my dad and I is that whenever it's just the two of us and we gather together, the conversation often turns to faith. 
And it was sometime around the third day, we're sitting in the gondola riding up the ski slope, and the conversation turns to faith. This time it was a little bit different. My dad begins to tell me about this thing called the Romans Road of Salvation. If you're familiar with it or not, it, it, it kind of covers some key verses in the first ten chapters of Romans. He begins to talk about how we've all fallen short of the glory of God, that we've all sinned, that, that even I sin. Yet Jesus came and lived and died for us. And, but then he rose from the dead and he said that if we believe in Jesus, believe that he is the Son of God with our heart and, and profess with our mouth that we have faith in him, then we shall be saved from our sins. Now as my dad was sharing this with me, I didn't think a whole lot of it because I was fairly familiar with most of it, but then he did something different. He asked me if I wanted to be a Christian. If I wanted to make Jesus Christ my Lord and Savior. And now I was a little confused because I thought I was already there. I already considered myself a Christian. I already knew God. And so I'm thinking in my head, well, duh. And to my dad, I said, yes. And so we prayed together, and a little while later after we got home, I was baptized in our church. And then to me, following my baptism, it seemed like my faith is now official. I had made this public confession of faith in life and the world around me. Everything would change. And I think about the only thing that really changed were my expectations. I thought, now, since my faith was public, now God has to listen to me. Now I have bargaining power with God. You know, now I thought I could pray, and when I needed something, God had to answer. Or if I wanted something. In fact, I can remember a number of times when I really wanted something, I'd pray, Dear Lord, if you would just do this one thing for me, this one simple thing, you know I'll be good for you. Right? Or maybe when I got into trouble, which was often, I was like, God... Lord, get me out of this mess. God, if, if, if you do this for me, Lord, I will never do that again. Right? Sound familiar? Two of you, thank you. All right. So Now, I, I'm not saying that we shouldn't ask God for anything. In fact, Jesus encourages us to pray, to ask God for things, because God knows what, what we want and what we need before, our, before we ask, but he encourages us to ask anyway. But how many of us have tried telling God how things are going to be? Or we try telling God to do it our way? And sometimes in that way, we're all kind of like Peter. At least I am. And then it was in July of 1998 when things were going really good in my life. Things were going my way, except... There was this incompleteness in me, this, this inside of me that like there was something more I needed to do, something more I was supposed to be doing, and, and I couldn't figure out what it was because nothing I tried fulfilled it. So I finally did the only thing left I knew to do. I prayed. And one weekend I decided just to, to clear my schedule. No work. No friends, no traveling, no going out. I was just going to stay at home and sit in my room and read Scripture and pray and pray and read Scripture. And that's what I did all weekend long. And I spent a lot of my time focused on reading the four Gospels. And as I came to the end of the book of John, the passage we, wrote, we, we read today, that's when it happened. And I felt like God spoke to me. 
Because something happened as I read this passage, and I suddenly began to relate to Peter. His profession, his betrayal, his shame, his remorse, and it all hit me. And Jesus asked Peter, do you love me? Do you love me more than these? And I was wondering, is he asking Peter, do you love me at all? Do you love me more than the food I've prepared for you? Do you love me more than your friends here? Do you love me more than your job as a fisherman? Peter, do you really, truly love me? And I was struck by these words because as I read on, Peter's response was my response. But I felt like Jesus was asking me, not just Peter. And I heard Jesus ask, Daniel, do you love me? Do you love me more than these? Do you love me at all? Do you love me more than food? Do you love me more than your friends? Do you love me more than your job? Daniel, do you really, truly love me? And so when Peter said, Lord, yes, I love you. That was my response. Yes, Lord, I love you. And I knew that Jesus knew I loved him, yet I was living for me. And though I love Jesus with all my heart and all my mind and all my soul and all my strength, I've been living this casual Christian life. I, I felt like I was a good person, but I had to do things my own way. Jesus said, feed my sheep. Now, what do you mean, Jesus? Now, I understood the metaphor that Jesus was using. That, 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 I knew that God is the great shepherd, and, and I knew that the sheep meant the people. And then I realized that Jesus was telling Peter and Jesus was telling me to feed God's people. Is that what you really want, Jesus? Is that what you really want from me? And then Jesus asks again, do you love me? And like flashing bright, bold font, the words on the page jumped off at me. And, and again, Peter's response was my response, yes, Lord, you know that I love you. And so Jesus reaffirms his command Take care of my lambs. But then a third time, Jesus asks, Do you really love me? And that third time, that third time hurt. It, it cut to the core. It, it, it wrenched my heart and soul as it did Peter's. Because it's like Jesus was asking me again, Daniel, do you really love me? And Peter and I answered in unison, Lord, you know everything. You know that I love you. You know that I love you with all of my heart and mind and soul and strength. You know I love you with all that I've got. And then Jesus gets up and says, Feed my sheep. Your life will no longer be your own. Now follow me. And I realized from that moment that Jesus was calling me to, to follow him. And after more prayer and discernment and discussion with my pastor, my call is, is affirmed. In fact, he kind of says, I was wondering when you're going to figure it out. 
Jesus was calling me to feed and to care for his lambs. He was calling me to preach and to teach and exhort, to encourage God's children, all people that is. He was calling me to share the gospel, the good news of great joy with everyone, and to make disciples. He was calling me to help bring healing and love and God's grace to this world that so desperately needs more of God's love and grace and healing. And ever since then, I've been learning what it means to feed and to tend God's sheep. And the reality and the truth of this is that Jesus is calling all of us. Jesus is asking all of us, do we love him? And if we do, then follow him. That is, if we love Jesus, we follow him. That if you love Jesus You will follow him and be his disciples. He tells us to follow him and that follow him is an invitation to do better, to be better, and to make life better. He he says that the road will get rough. It, It won't always be easy. Things won't always go your way. But even when they're hard, even when things don't go your way, even when you have failures in faith, Follow him. Follow him anyway. So I'm asking you, do you love Jesus? If so, then we are called to follow. And it doesn't mean that all of us will always get it right. And it doesn't mean that all of us are going to quit our daytime jobs to go into full-time ministry. In fact, more, more likely it means that to follow Jesus means to follow him right where we are, right where you are. That means that God is calling you right where you are, right now, today. Yet that call doesn't just stay right here where you are. It doesn't just stay in this beautiful building. It follows us when we go out beyond these walls because Jesus sends out his followers. He says, go, go and share the gospel. Go share the good news. Go to all people and make disciples of them. Make disciples of them. Go beyond these walls. Go out into your daily jobs. Go out into your school. Go out into your sports. Go out into your hobbies. Go out into your clubs. Go out into your meeting places. Go out to your grocery stores. Go out wherever it is that you go and see the opportunity to follow Jesus and to share the love of Jesus with every person we meet. Is in some way, we all can share the love of Jesus with others as a sign of our love for Jesus. We're all in this together, learning what it means to be sheep of the Good Shepherd, learning what it means to tend and to care and to feed the flock and to be sheep in the kingdom of God. Because God is calling us. Jesus is calling each of you, even you. But Jesus is calling. Are you answering the call? Even if you feel lost, even if you feel unworthy, even if you feel unable, Jesus is still calling you and welcoming you into his kingdom and to follow him. And it doesn't matter how you have failed or messed up in the past. And it doesn't matter what you're going through or what your mess is right now. And it doesn't matter whether you think you can or cannot. Because Jesus is calling you. And his grace will cover you. And his love will restore you. Jesus is calling you. He's calling you right now. 
So let's answer the call and follow him today. Amen? Holy God, I thank you that you call us into your kingdom and to follow you and to live out our love for you. Lord, as we learn what this means, give us the courage to follow you where you lead us and to share your grace wherever we go. In Jesus' name, amen.